Eddie Chavez. Ruben Nava. And Jesse Romero. Jesus 911. Soul Patrol, two-man car, 10-8. Jess Romero and Dan Schneider <clears throat> reporting for duty, sir. Dan, are you 10-8, brother? Are you on? I, I am 10-8 reporting for duty, sir. Dan, it's always good to have you and Kyle on Wednesdays. Uh, uh, this is when we bring you. Kyle and Dan are like the training officers. Okay, They're the guys that take the rookies and break them in on the streets. And uh, it's just a pleasure to have these guys I'm, I'm glad I reconnected with Dan. I met Dan years ago, and uh, we hit it off, but we just kind of uh, fell out of each other's radar. And uh, by the good graces of God, uh, we reconnected again. In fact, I reconnected with Dan because I, I went to a conference to get trained deeper in spiritual warfare. And I, know, I saw that Dan was one of the instructors there. It's called the Liber Cristo Institute. And uh, that's where I reconnected with my old friend Dan. Dan, tell us a little bit about Liber Cristo, by the way. Uh, Libra Cristo is an, uh, it's an organization of, of lay people and deacons who serve in the capacity of uh, uh, serving the ministry of exorcism to assist priests that are that are light, you know, uh, uh, trained priests who work in the, in the field of exorcism. Um, and so um, started by Father Ripperger and we work in support of any priest that works in the um, in the field of exorcism. Hey, Dan, let me ask you a question. I say Father Ripper Gur. You say Jur. Which one is it? I don't. I don't know. Um. Hmm. We're gonna have to I ask think, Kyle. Ky- Kyle is his right hand man. So we'll. I think it's uh, it's not personal preference, but it depends on where you're educated. I think. <laughs> okay. All right. Hey, we're gonna talk about some spiritual warfare issues in the culture and in the church, and I want to get your take on it. First okay. Thing I want to. Yeah. The first thing I want to talk about, Dan, is uh. <clears throat> I want to talk about the German bishops who have gone off the rails at this point in time. They're proclaiming homosexuality normal, and they're saying that adultery is not a grave sin. I I want to just pick your brain on the spiritual warfare aspects of this. Let me just share a couple of of, uh, of, uh, of sentences here from LifeSite News. It says, The Commission for Marriage and Family of the German Bishops Conference has come to a consensus that... (laughs) That homosexuality, if I don't laugh, I'll cry, is a normal form of sexual predisposition. Two German prelates have also claimed that Amoris Laetitia teaches that sexual relationships formed after a divorce are neither gravely sinful nor a bar to the reception of Holy Communion. On December 5th, the German Bishops' Conference published a press release detailing the results of an expert consultation on the topic, The Sexuality of Man how to discuss it scientifically, theologically, and how to assess it ecclesiastically. The consultation, which included a panel of bishops, sexologists, <clears throat> moral yeah, theologians, is- dogmatic theologians, and canon lawyers took place in Berlin on, on December 4th, and the event coincided with the German bishops, their, their own synodal path. Then I was looking at, Okay, so the German bishops are calling for these se- a sexologist to be on this panel. I looked up what a sexologist is. Okay, apparently it's a new degree that you can get, kind of like uh, you know women's studies. <clears throat> Sexology is uh, is the study of sexual behavior. It requires a master's degree, and here it says uh, they push the boundaries of sex education and explore fields that were once taboo. The work of a sexologist could include working with trauma victims, assisting sex workers and legal challenge with with legal challenges, educating doctors in developing nations, or designing sex objects for pornography. This is a multi sexology is often seen as a multidisciplinary approach to sexual and intimate well being. Yeah, it it just go it it just descends from here. I don't don't even want to read the rest of what the sex therapists actually do with their clients. Dan, uh, is this just mistaken? Is this just intellectually misguided? Is this just, uh, oops, I made a mistake? Is there something diabolical to successors of the apostles that are normalizing what the Bible, 
what God saw fit to destroy two cities called Sodom and Gomorrah, is, is this what Pope Paul VI called the smoke of Satan has entered into a crevice in the Catholic Church? Yeah, literally, he said to enter the sanctuary, which is the, the proper milieu of the priest uh, in, the, in the clerical state. So, yeah, so this this is – first of all, let me preface this by two, two statements. One is something you and I have discussed, and I think we need to continue to bring this out so that our, our listeners and those and those who are, are equally outraged by this type of um, um, statements coming forth and this type of misdirection – and let's, let's just call it what it is. It's heresy. Um, can, Code of Canon Law 212, as, as, as you have been pointing out, not only do we have the right as lay faithful – to to make to 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 make known when we have when when the hierarch when when those in the cler- the, tr- the clergy are, are teaching erroneous things we have the duty or the obligation to make our opinions known as um, to the rest of the faithful and it says in canon law for the good of the church and this is why we bring this up we're not here to criticize because you know what I'm not going anywhere I'm not going anywhere you know what I mean I'm I'm not leaving the church I'm not I'm like th- Peter where is there uh, yeah. to go you got the words of eternal life I'm going anywhere I'm staying here. So, so that's one principle we need to – before we ground our conversation. So that's one. We have the right and the duty and the obligation to make known to the, uh, the rest of the lay faithful and to the hierarchy when there is erroneous things being taught. Um, the second is the sensus fidelium. It's, it's a theological truism uh, or dictum, the sense of the faithful. The sense of the faithful is always in – it always is in union with the, the the ancient teachings of the church, and so this type of stuff, um, this homoerotic art, this 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 um, these really just false teachings that says uh, homosexuality is is proper um, is is smacks against uh, the sensus fidelium, our own human experience as married men, and also under the ob- under, under obligations of Canon two twelve, we're going to speak out against it. Now that being said. Um, what this what the these bishops are saying is it's a complete affrontment and divergence from what what some theologians have called the bombshell of the theology of the body of Pope John Paul II, who very adroitly explains the twofold ends of the marital act as both procreative and unitive. And when you separate those twofold ends of the procreate act, and it's no longer it's no longer procreative that the marital act is only unitive. There is mortal sin, and wherever there is grave sin, the demon is always right there. You know, case exploit after, that, right? Uh, they'll exploit that case after case after case that we get through both both here uh, locally in my work here, but also through through the society, Father Ripperger. There's always an element of of witchcraft, usually an element of witchcraft in combination with sexual immorality, grave sexual morality. So homosexual acts. Um, which, by the way, the catechism says are acts which cry to God for justice. Um, these are grave acts. Um, so I don't know how these bishops can reconcile that with the catechism apart. Again, they're on their own what they call a synodal path, um, which, which, which is which means absolute, they've gone off the rails. Which, which, they, which they've gone off the rails in a complete rupture, a complete rupture with the ancient teaching of, of the church. So, yeah, this, so yeah. this reminds me this. This going down their own synodal path, the German bishops' conference, and they insisted on this, okay, this, this widespread rebellion. They did this without the Vatican's permission. And this, this has a lot of traditional Catholics, German Catholics, worried. This, to me, is the prophecy of Akita Japan playing out before our eyes. Here's yeah. what Our Lady of Akita Japan said. The work of the yeah. devil will infiltrate even into the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishops against bishops. The priests who venerate me will be scorned and opposed by their confreres. Churches and altars sacked. The church will be full of those who accept compromises. <clears throat> and the demon will press many priests and consecrated souls to leave the service of the Lord. The mm-hmm. demon will be especially implacable against souls consecrated to God. We're seeing Akita Japan play out in Germany right now. Absolutely. Um, you and I had an interesting conversation, um, seminary stories that priests have confided in us. One, going back to Akita, going back to – that is a pro- approved apparition, by the way, um, long-held approved apparition um, in Japan. One is a story that, that was related to me by a priest that they were forbidden in minor seminary to, to pray the rosary uh, or attend Eucharistic adoration. I thought that I had to drop the mic moment until you came up with a story from one of your priest friends that told you even that made me go, no way. 
I, I can't believe that's true. It's shocking. If you don't mind, if you share that story. And I've heard this. I've heard of these things before. But this is this is where the demon is entering into into the formation of future priest. I'll and this is we got one minute. I'll share I'll, I'll share that story. The first as soon as we start on the next segment, because uh, I don't want to get cut off by commercial. But uh, then. Uh, when, before I share that story and we got about a minute left, <clears throat> Pope Paul the six, he said towards the end of his pontificate, just uh, he said uh, the church is in the process of auto demolition. Yeah, it's a, a nice way of saying self destruction. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I mean, yeah. what the German church is doing whole, here, that sounds yeah. to me like throwing the path to auto demolition of the German Catholic Church. What do you think? Well, it's, it sounds to me like, a, a, you know, a, a synodal path is just another uh, Martin Luther w- wasn't clever enough to use that terminology. But it's basically um, from the same part of the world that gave us the, ref- the deformation, uh, the, the Protestant Reformation, so-called, is, is where we're getting this. It's, it's, it's shocking that it's coming out of there and, and to call it synodal path or whatever they're calling it. Let's call it what it is. They're breaking from the tradition, uh, the doctrinal and dogmatic traditions and teachings of the church the mor- and the moral authority of the church. This article says that the German, the German bishops, they they say that homosexuality is as normal as heterosexuality, and that neither sexual attraction attraction should be changed. We'll talk more about this. We got Dan Schneider. We're looking at the diabolical infiltration in the Catholic Church. I'm going to be sharing a pretty powerful story up next. Don't change that dial. Two man car. Ten eight. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is Jesse Romero. Join me on a pilgrimage of faith and discovery to Poland for the 100th year anniversary of the birth of St. John Paul II in May of 2020. Together we'll experience the faith, beauty, and culture of Poland and become imbibed with the spirit of John Paul II. We'll visit the town of Wadowice, where John Paul was born, and the city of Krakow, where he was ordained and later became bishop. We'll also travel to Jasnogora and visit Our Lady of Czestochowa, And we'll have a chance to venerate the original image of the merciful Jesus at St. Faustina's convent and the city that St. Maximilian Kolbe built for the Immaculata. Finally, we'll pay a visit to Auschwitz, where St. Maximilian Kolbe was martyred. This is a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to worship and discover your own faith at places where St. John Paul II grew in his own love for our Lord. For more information or how to join this pilgrimage, visit my website at jesseromero.com. Jesus said in Luke 17, When you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have only done our duty. According to St. John of the Cross, God is pleased with the little deeds we do in secret. He takes more pleasure in these than in a multitude of grand works that we may do out of the desire to be seen by others. May God help us to do the things that please Him and not just to appear great in the eyes of others. selling your home or your business property this is terry barber real estate for life underwrites the terry and jesse show and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world and when they receive their referral fee they will give 80 percent of it to a pro-life organization wow that's 80 percent realestateforlife.org 877-LIFE-US-1 Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Soul Patrol, two men car, we're 10 for Jesus. 10 for Mary, and we're, and we're uh, under, the, uh, un- under the, uh, the leadership of St. Michael the Archangel. I got Dan Schneider, Jesse Romero. <clears throat> Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, we talk about all things spiritual warfare. We're talking about spiritual warfare as it relates to the infiltration in the Catholic Church. We have 
the German bishops who are proclaiming that homosexuality and adultery are not grave sins. And uh, in fact, I'm looking at the article here from LifeSite. It says uh, they also agree, the German bishops, that homosexuality is as normal as heterosexuality. And it says there was also agreement that the sexual preference of man expresses itself in puberty and assumes a heterosexual or homosexual orientation. That's a lie. That's unscientific, what the, the, the German bishops have just uh, bought into. And one of the good German bishops, his name is Cardinal Walter Brandmuller. He's retired. He's, uh, he's president emeritus of the Pontifical Committee for Historical Sciences. He's warned that, that the German bishops proceeding down this path, he says that one that questions the church's teachings on the celibate male priesthood, homosexuality and marriage, could lead to a national church without nearly any ties to Rome. The dubia cardinal, cardinal stated that this would be certainly the surest path into final decline. You want to comment on that, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, as you as you pointed out, there's not time to really get into it here, but it is absolutely um, not only is this a, is, is is what they're saying a, a violation of church teaching. It's also it's also uh, 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 the long history of church teaching. Modern science and modern psychology has also shown this, um, and that. And the fact that they say that orientation is change of orientation is not possible is is completely false. So effective, what's called reparative ther- therapy for the listeners. If you have same sex attraction or someone in your family is struggling with same sex attraction, look up the the seminal work of Joseph Nicolosi. He was recently passed away, but his son is continuing the work. Um, and and they're showing that by by. Um, therapeutically helping the person overcome the woundedness in their gender identity that they can p- have fully in- reintegrated lives according to their na- their their nature and not mil- that which that which homosexual same sex attraction militates. So it's absolutely false uh, statement, and it's so effective as a reparative therapy. And Dr. Nicolosi, it's been outlawed in the state of California. It's I think the state of Florida is going to outlaw it. Certain cities, municipalities are voting to to outlaw this therapy because it's that effective. The, the 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 liberal progressive uh, government action against it uh, shows you the da- how how absolutely effective it is. It reintegrates in a holistic way, working on human nature. This is very Saint Thomas, very Thomistic. Grace builds on nature, and so what right and good therapy does, it helps one to be healed at the level of gender where same sex attraction begins to to manifest itself. So so the, so these guys are actually these these bishops are actually absolutely false, not only in the church's teaching but in modern science as well. Dan, I'm I'm looking at this Vatican Archbishop featured in uh, homoerotic painted that he commissioned. It says the Archbishop Vincenzo Paglia, who's also been appointed by Pope Francis as the president of the Pontifical Pope John Paul II Institute for Studies on Marriage and Family, he commissioned a homosexual artist to paint a picture, really a homoerotic picture on the facade of the cathedral church of the Diocese of Terninarni, Amelia. And uh, it depicts Jesus carrying nets to heaven, filled with naked and semi-nude homosexuals, transsexuals, prostitutes, and drug dealers, jumbled together in erotic interactions that I won't mention on this radio. <clears throat> He's uh, the, this guy, the, the artist is a, is a local male hairdresser, and he wanted to actually be a lot more graphic, but they had to hold him back a little bit. His name is Sinelli. He said that in four months that he was painting this picture, that Car- Archbishop or Cardinal, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. is he Archbishop or Cardinal? It's Archbishop Pagalia, now in charge of the John Paul II Institute. He never once talked to him about salvation. Never, never tried to evangelize this homosexual artist. Instead, he just chose to accompany him. Dan, yeah. um, aren't we supposed to take custody of our eyes? Isn't that one of the ways the diabolical comes into the person and, and to attack and torment us? I mean, what what else can you call this? Is this misguided for an archbishop to have a homoerotic painting put on a church wall where people are coming in to pray? Is this misguided? Is this, uh, you know, kind of a bonehead move? Or is this diabolical? What do you say? Well, um, yeah, all the above. Um, if you look at the catechism, the catechism distinguishes, and this is a good a good point of discussion for us. The catechism distinguishes between between sacrilege and blasphemy. Sacrilege, violation 
of the first commandment, blasphemy against the second commandment. This is what it says. Under the category of irreligion, this is sacrilege, Catechism 2120. Sacrilege consists in profaning or treating unworthy the sacraments and other liturgical actions as well as persons, things, or places consecrated to God. Sacrilege is a grave sin, especially when committed against the Eucharist, for in this sacrament, the true body of Christ is made substantially present for us. So to put to put a, a, within the sanctuary, a place specifically consecrated to God, to place homoerotic art depicting oneself in a, in a local in a local known homosexual in a, in a loving homo, homoerotic embrace. Um, it's it's sacrilegious. Let's just call it what it is. This is what the catechism calls it. Let's return to the language of the church. This is what the church would call it. Um, you know, guys from my neighborhood would call it something quite different that we can't repeat on the radio. But but let's just call it using precise language. This is sacrilegious. This is an affrontment against the dignity of God in the sacred space of the holy tabernacle where Christ is present in 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 the in the in the, in the, in the Eucharist. In addition, this is also remember a principle. The demon is is about it sets about a complete distortion of all things sacred. It's a diabolic inversion. The erotic, it talks about the, this portraying of the erotic. The erotic is something that for, 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 for even before the Jewish exegetes, but Christian, Christians from the beginning have been viewing the erotic letter of the Song of Songs as both the love of, of the desire of the soul for God and God's love, Christ for the soul, and also the church. And so this erotic desire, which is neither masculine or feminine, but it's the feminine like response to God, this this response to God for union with God. Read what Teresa of Avila, doctor of the church, John of the cross, doctor of the church in their mystical theology of the union of God using erotic terms. The the transverberation, the Barini statue of the transverberation of, of Teresa. Um, these things show how using the erotic letter of the Song of Songs and our understanding of human sexuality as our own orientation towards God, a loving, holy longing for God that is completely sexless. It's non-carnal. What this is is an affrontment to that. This is a mockery, a diabolic mockery of man's of man's love and desire for God. And look what happens after this. Read in, in today's life site. You've now got a now you've got homoerotic art. Depicting Jesus as sodomizing a child in the bus mm -hmm. stops in in Rome in in Italy, so you see when the church allows this stuff into her into the house of God, secular culture just follows. This is what Paul the Sixth was talking about: the smoke of Satan has entered the sanctuary. If this if there is never a more evident. Uh, uh, example of smoke of Satan entering the sanctuary is homoerotic art under the guise of accompaniment of God that forgives all sinners, etc. This this is an affrontment on many many levels. Let me tell you, Dan, that there's actually a psychologist in the article I'm reading. <clears throat> he thinks that Archbishop Paglia is is a sick puppy. Here's what it says: In July of 2016, <clears throat> under the direction of Pag Archbishop Paglia. The Pontifical Council for the Family issued a new sex ed program that includes lascivious and pornographic images so disturbing that one psychologist suggested that the archbishop be evaluated by a review board in accordance with the norms of the Dallas Charter, which are meant to protect children from sexual abuse. So this Paglia has issued a new sex ed program that this one psychologist says this guy's sick. He says... My immediate professional reaction was this was that this obscene or pornographic approach abuses youth psychologically and spiritually. Dr. Richard Fitzgibbons, a psychiatrist who's been a consultant to the Congregation for the Clergy at the Vatican and served as an adjunct professor at the John Paul II Institute for Studies on Marriage and Family at the Catholic University of America, said, as a professional who's treated both priests, perpetrators, and the victims of abuse crisis in the church, what I found particularly troubling was that the pornographic images in this program are similar to those used by adult sexual predators of adolescence. Yeah. And this is the infiltration of Catholicism. Pope Leo XIII warned us about it in the St. Michael the Archangel prayer. Pope Paul VI warned us about it. John Paul II even warned us about it two years before he became uh, the Pope. He says we've entered into a time where the church is facing off against the anti-church, the gospel versus the anti-gospel. And uh, and he gave he gave a speech about the fact that the line the, the the lines have been drawn clear right now. Yeah, I, I think I think this this the psychologist make or psychi psychologist makes a good point 
That is, if 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 you work, if you're a manager at Lowe's uh, uh, and and you start showing these images that are so called used for uh, um, uh, for child uh, development or whatever, you'd be you would be fired and Lowe's would be sued for that. So why is it okay when an archbishop puts these images out and under the guise of sex education? It's absolutely false. Um, and so I think you're absolutely right. I think what we're seeing is the same pattern of grooming. This is what the psychologist picked up. This is just, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just repeating what, what he is saying. If we, you, we've all been through that safe environment training through our diocese to serve and work with the youth, right? Most of us have that's, that's work at the diocesan level. So the same pattern of the abuser that lowers the, the, the predator that lowers the, the inhibitions through pornography, et cetera. This same pattern is, was, is what the psychologist is saying is what's being put forth. Um, by the church in this particular area. And it's very frightening. And we need to wake up when it's when it takes secular, the secular society to correct the church uh, at, at this level. It's pretty it's pretty it's pretty uh, damning um, for those involved. Dan, uh, Archbishop Paglia, he's also on record of saying that he will hold hands with somebody dying of euthanasia, that he was, you know, er, er, every faithful, uh, you know, he's saying that obviously we've got to promote a culture that opposes assisted suicide, but he says, you know what? I would hold the hand of someone dying from assisted suicide. You know what? I wouldn't, Dan. I'd be evangelizing the person. I wouldn't be letting them kill myself in my pre- kill themselves in my presence. I would be praying for them and giving them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to talk about that on the next segment, how I gave a Catholic priest as he was dying in my arms. I preached to a Catholic priest and had him repent at the last minute. But Dan, uh, what do you think about, uh, I mean, would you sit there and say somebody's killing themselves in your presence? Say, oh, no, worry, I'll, I'll, no, no problem. I'll accompany you and, you know, we'll just, uh, you know, eat a gelato together as you're dying. Eddie, Dan, what, what nonsense is this? This is a lack of courage at the very least, if not complete cowardness. Yeah, the, the catechism is very clear. Um, you know, to accompany someone to commit a mortal sin, which is suicide, um, this is not to say there's not this is not a gray area for moral theologians to discuss, but for a priest of the living God, a bishop of the living God to a so-called accompany someone and not accompany them. And you know, think about the word viaticum, the Latin word viaticum, via, um, via cum, to going on the path with you. The priest gives Christ to uh, the forgiveness of Christ, the Eucharist as well, to go to, to, to accompany you on the journey to heaven, not to stand there and watch someone. Uh, commit suicide. It's a, it's 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 absolutely again another diabolic. We'll right Stay tuned. Welcome to our January eleventh, two thousand twenty Spiritual Warfare Conference. Every year without fail, this is our most popular, well-attended event. This year's Spiritual Warfare Conference will host Adam Bly, a Catholic demonologist, and an auxiliary member of the International Association of Exorcists, along with Dr. Luis Sandoval, a psychiatrist who's part of the Healing, Deliverance, and Exorcism team for the Diocese of Orange. These two gentlemen bring tons of experience and expertise in the area of spiritual warfare. This is going to be a high-information Catholic seminar, I'll be there as well, sharing some riveting stories on the diabolical and liberation found through Jesus Christ from my best-selling book, The Devil in the City of Angels. Mark your calendars, come and join us, and meet other radio hosts from Jesus 911. Contrary to popular belief, spiritual warfare is not demon-centered. It's Christ-centered. Come join us and learn how to armor up and fight the good fight of faith. Catholics, wake up. Don't hit the snooze button. Join us at St. Christopher Catholic Church, 629 South Glendora Avenue, West Covina, California, on January 11, 2020. See you then. Strength and honor in Jesus' name. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And here's an easy way to support us by going to smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center or Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And when you log in your Amazon account and you purchase products, A portion of it will go right back in supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And it doesn't cost you a dime. I want to thank you ahead of time because that supports us year-round. May God bless you and your family. 
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Well, Archbishop Paglia would watch somebody commit euthanasia in his presence and hold his hand. Watch somebody commit a mortal sin and die in his presence. Not on my watch. Probably about 15 years ago. I got Dan Schneider, by the way. It's a two-man car. We're 10-8. About 15 years ago, there was a priest. I won't mention his name or the diocese out of respect. He was my associate pastor uh, in, the, in the parish I was attending. Uh, Santa Rosa Catholic Church, San Fernando, California. That's all I'll say. We were good friends. He would always visit me. He was probably in his late 30s back then. Uh, he baptized my first child. <clears throat> He'd come over the house. Uh, we'd shoot the breeze, talk politics, talk about culture, talk about philosophy, religion, scripture, uh, to the wee hours of the morning. Well, uh, you don't know his last name, so it's Father John. He's associate pastor. So one day, the priest, the pastor, Father David, starts saying, telling the congregation, hey, we got to start praying uh, for, for Father, Father John. He's, uh, he's come up. We just discovered that he has cancer. He moved over to Texas, moved in with his parents, and he's in a hospice condition at his parents' house, so just pray for him every... He's in his early 30s, mid-30s. So I'm saying, what? Now, he would have told me if he had cancer. We were good friends. All of a sudden, he's gone. I hear nothing of him. So every weekend, we're at Prayers of the Faith. We're praying for Father John, you know, that God would, would heal him of cancer. So uh, I'm, I'm bugging the, the secretary every week, Maria. Maria, can I have Father John's number? No, you can't. He doesn't want to talk to anybody. He'll want to talk to me. We're good friends. Maria, can I have Father John's No, you can't. He doesn't want to talk to anybody. Tell him it's Jesse Romero. He'll want to talk to me. We're good friends. I kept bugging her every week. Finally, after about two or three months, she calls me up one day. And we're praying every week for Father John's cancer at Mass. So uh, <clears throat> Maria calls me up, says, Jess, uh, Father John would like to talk to you. I said, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. She goes, in fact, he's here. He's here at the rectory here in San Fernando, California. He's here from Texas. I said, you're kidding. He goes, he wants to see you right now. I said, of course, it was like 1 o'clock. I worked at 4 p.m. I worked uh, p.m. shift. So I, I threw on my uniform. I uh, put a windbreaker on. I drove to the parish. I figured I'll spend two or three hours with Father, with, with Father John. Then I'll drive to work downtown L.A. from there. I get there. She says he's in the back room. Man, I bolted through that door. I'm running down the hallway and stuff. Uh, open the door. He's in a, hospi- in a hospice bed. Like, like it's a hospital condition. The bed room that that uh, he's in in the rectory he's got all kinds of wires in his mouth and all kinds of tubes and he has uh he has some type of you know in, they're, they're they're injecting him with something father uh father john how are you i gave him a big old holy hug you know just just embrace man just a i was so happy to see him you were so happy to see me i said father father they've been telling us that you're dying of cancer you're in texas and stuff he goes i never went to texas i've been here the whole time i said what they told us you were in texas he said, Father, you, they say you're dying of cancer. We're praying for you every, every weekend, and I pray for you every day. And then I looked at him, and he looked very thin. He was like six foot two, tall guy. He looked very thin. He looked like his, his, his face looked like a skull. I said, Father, I don't know what it was. You know, God doesn't talk to me. I'm not going to tell you, you know, the, the Lord spoke to me. God doesn't talk to me. Yeah, I've never heard his voice. He probably talks to me through impressions in my heart, inaudibly. But I can't say I heard a voice. But all of a sudden, I felt very strong in my heart that he's not dying of cancer. He's dying of AIDS. I asked him, Father John, are you dying of AIDS? And he said, yes, I'm dying of AIDS. I said, Father John, Father. And I just, I just put two and two together. I didn't, I didn't uh, have to ask him who his lover was. I just said, Father, you're dying. Have you been to confession? You got to repent. And then he went off on me. He sounded like, I guess he felt like Father James Martin would right now. He goes, the church is wrong. Jesse, the church 
has to change her teachings. That, that This is mean of the church. The church is wrong on this issue. The church must change. The Bible must change. We have to change. Oh, at this point, I felt nothing but the diabolical Dan coming from his words. And I said, yeah. now I, I, I all of a sudden, you know, Canon 212, paragraph 907. I'm like, oh, no, oh, no. I just felt like this courage from the Holy Spirit to talk back to a priest respectfully. I started saying, Father, be quiet. Be quiet. That's nonsense. You've got to repent. Father, what are you saying? You're a priest of God. Father, repent, Father. You've got to go to confession. Father, you're wrong. The church is not wrong. So we're going back and forth, Dan, like a, like a football coach or two football coaches at a Super Bowl game. Man, he spit on me. I'm spitting on him. I'm mean, literally, I mean, we were that close to each other. We went at it for about 10 minutes. There was, Dan, I could sense evil in the room. It was very thick. You can cut it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, it was all the Holy Spirit. It wasn't me at this point. <clears throat> I grabbed him by his T-shirt. He's on, the, on, his, on a supine position. He's on the bed. He's very weak. He can't fight back. <clears throat> I said, I started grabbing him by his, his T-shirt. And I'm shaking him now. Because I'm, 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 uh, remember, you know, this is to almost 20 years ago. I'm a young, relatively young Mexican. Mexicans, we think that priests walk on water, Dan. You know how the Latino right. community is. They're demigods. You never talk back. You, the, the last thing in my mind is that a priest was a homosexual 20 years ago. I mean, I thought they were all chaste, holy men that walked on what? That's, that's the, and a lot of Mexicans are still like that right now, Okay. Uh, I've red pilled, uh, you know, my eyes are open now. I pray for them, but, but, uh, they're just men like you and I, they're consecrated men, priests of the most high God, but boy, oh boy, the devil goes after them as much as, as, as with more intensity than he goes after us. So I'm shaking them. Father, you've got to repent. Well, something broke through. Maybe it was my intensity, my passion. I don't know what it was. He started yelling. Okay. 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 So I let him go. I, I let him fall back on the bed. He said, he let go a huge sigh of relief, like, man, like, man, I, I needed to hear this. He goes, oh, then he goes, call Father David. I ran down the hall, knocked at the pastor's door. I said, Father David, Father John wants to, wants to go to confession. He goes, what? He goes, what did you do to him? He grabs his, his, uh, his stole, puts it around his neck, and he runs over to the room. I'm outside. I'm pacing up and down like a father who's waiting for his wife to give birth, and I'm praying the rosary on my fingers. I don't have a rosary with me. I'm praying on my fingers. I finished the whole rosary, so he was there longer than 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. Father David walks out. He looks at me, and he, and he, and he gives me a thumbs up with the, with the, with the thumb sign up. And, uh, and, uh, and he just wiped his forehead like, wow. He went back to his office. He says, whatever you did, good job. I walked back into the, the, the room where Father John was at. He, he was there quiet. He was there, he was very pensive. I went over to him, Dan, and I hugged him around the neck in a genuine hug, a fraternal hug of love, of love. I mean, I just had total love for his soul. And I just started weeping, and he started crying. And I said, Father... I'm so happy. I'm gonna, you're going to go to heaven, and one day you're not going to be sick anymore. And one day, uh, uh, please, God, I'm going to go to heaven, and we'll continue this relationship and this friendship forever. And, and I remember back then, I'm saying it. I, I, I said, Father, when you get to heaven, one day kiss Jesus in the forehead. Tell him I love him. Kiss Mother Mary. Tell her I love her. And I even said, I'm, I said, and tell Bishop Fulton Sheen, tell him how much he's meant to me. He's been my he's been my my surrogate pastor and teacher, you know, through these cassette tapes that I've purchased. Tell him how much I love him as well for what he's done for my faith. And uh, then he told me, he goes, Jesse, you know why I called you to come and see me? Because I haven't called any parishioners and I'm not going to call anybody else. He says, I live here with six priests in the rectory and there's four thousand families in the parish. It was one of those mega Catholic Spanish churches. He said, you know why I called you? I said, no, why'd you call him? He goes, because I knew you're the only person in the parish that would tell me what I needed to hear and that would speak to me like you spoke to me. He goes, thank you. I left very emotional, Dan. I was very emotional. 
I wasn't going to yeah. accompany him to hell and let's let him die without, you know, without trying to evangelize them and, and tell him and set him straight. I get to work. It was it was the, in the days of pagers. There was no cell phones yet. Okay, I had a pager. Yeah. It went off at work. Heard the message in the evening. Maria said, uh, Father John had just passed away, and I just wanted to let you know. So I hope and pray that I'll see him one day. It seems to me as if he died with forgiveness of sins, received the sacrament, and uh, and now from the other side of eternity, I hope he's praying for us. Please, God. And uh, he knows the truth now that's going to set us free, and that's following Jesus Christ and the teachings of Holy Mother Church. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. What a great story. I mean, that was uh, truly the— uh, the last verse in the in the, the book of James, uh, um, when when a soul was brought back from and from the error of his ways, the angels rejoice and a multitude of sins are forgiven. At that moment, the multitude of sins were forgiven. But we, the scripture doesn't tell us what, who sins, yours and his. But this is the courage that we need to do. We need we need to have that kind of courage. This is true accompaniment, and it's and it's and this is one of the hardest things for Christians to do. To, and it goes back to the very beginning that we talked about, proclaiming the truth in charity. This is very, very difficult. Christ did this. This is Jesus to the rich young man. We're never told if the rich young man uh, uh, ever came back and followed Jesus. It said he went away sad, and Jesus in his silence let him go away for a time. And so we have to be able to, to, to teach the speak the truth in charity to people. And accompaniment does not mean we accept anything that goes. That means in a loving and charitable way, we're very we're very direct and honest with people, and we entrust them uh, to Our Lady and to the Lord uh, ultimately, and and uh, just do the very best we can to be the eyes and ears of the Lord, to be the Cab Scouts, to be the to be the Popo, to to preach the truth to people the best we possibly can. And and who knows? It's in that boldness that you took. It's in the boldness that grace is. We've got to step out in a very very bold way. As 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 lay evangelists and as men, we got to step out in boldness and and make the ask. We make this is exactly what you did. So that that's a tremendous story. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, Dan, let me ask you a question. I'm I'm reading, and maybe this will spill into the next segment in uh, the the article on where it says Archbishop Paglia would hold hands with euthanasia candidate. He also says this, and I want to get your take. He says Paglia later told Crux now now dot com journalist that it is a heresy to say that Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus before killing himself, is in hell. I want you to deal with that. Is it a heresy for somebody to hold that position that Judas is in hell? I want to get Dan Schneider's take on the next segment. You're listening to Jesus 911, two-man car. Uh, These are uh, two alpha Catholics on Soul Patrol, talking about spiritual warfare Catholic style. Don't change that dial. Hands on Apologetics, you have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo, where we go wall to wall with defending, explaining, sharing the faith. Master Apologist, Carlo Broussard. Carlo, welcome to Hands on Apologetics. Hey, Gary, it's great to be back in the dojo, my friend. Master Apologist, Ken Hensley, welcome to Hands on Apologetics. Good to see you again, Gary. Good to be with you. Michael Barber, welcome. You have entered into the Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo. Gary, thanks for having me on. We are chatting with Master Apologist Carl Keating. Gary, it's great to be back with you. Coming into the dojo is our good friend Steve Ray. Thank you, Gary. Good to be here. Tim Staples, welcome to Hands On Apologetics. Hey, it's great to be with you, Gary. Thanks for having me on. Join many others in Gary Machuda's Apologetics Dojo. We have some of the best Catholic apologists in the nation. Streaming live weekdays from 10 to 11 a.m. Pacific. Hands-on apologetics on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Psalm 119 says, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. According to St. John Paul II, being a Christian means saying yes to Jesus Christ. It consists in surrendering to the word of God and relying on it, but also endeavoring to know better and better the profound meaning of this word. May God grant that we always rely on His word, read it often, and put it into practice.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Soul Patrol, Jesus 911, two-man car, two alpha males for Jesus. Jesus. On Soul Patrol, Patrol. speaking the truth and loving. We're we're giving you Catholic intel and Catholic briefing so that you can throw all this stuff in your war bag. bag. And you can go out there and save souls and slay error. Then I want to get your take. Archbishop Paglia, uh, in an interview with Crux, CruxNow.com, says that to hold the position that Judas uh, went to hell is heresy. What say you, Dan, based upon church, church teaching or evidence? Yeah, that's pretty bold to, 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 to go as far as call it heresy. Um, I want to, before, before we get to this, he, from the Catechism 2282, voluntary cooperation and suicide is contrary to the moral law. So I, I wonder if people like this, these advocates for death, um, would feel as 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 well if it were if it were not just a pill or a shot. If the if the if the person taking their own life decide they'd like to use a Glock or or an assault shotgun to kill themselves, if they would they just as willing to accompany. Um, it's absurd. But anyway, since we're on a low watt high T radio program, let's get into the topic of Judas. Yeah. I think it's another instance where we can look at how can we how do we rightly theologize? And when we were in the military, we were learned we we were we were taught how to how to zero our weapons. You guys probably had the same training in law enforcement. You sh- you triangulate your shot group. You shoot three bullets and you triangulate it. You get a piece of paper. You make a triangle and you adjust up right, left or up and down, left and right. The three bullets that help triangulate our theological and moral compass is scripture, tradition, and the magisterium of the church. Sacred Scripture, um, it's, you know, the, 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 the teaching on Judas or the understanding of Judas as, as being damned comes from Matthew 26, 24, better that he had not been born, the words of Christ. And then other, other, other things, Acts 1, uh, 16 to 25, when they took his office and gave it to somebody else and his road to perdition, etc. We know from Scripture he did commit suicide. We know that suicide is a grave, taking, taking human life is a grave sin. So that was sort of the scriptural, but it's still scripture underrepresents the issue. And when people criticize John Paul II, and what, what Pope John Paul II said was uh, that they don't allude for certain to eternal damnation, which is true. The scriptures don't allude to eternal damnation. So we have to look at the second bullet, the second bullet of this tri- theological moral triangulation. Um, and, and that is to the doctors of the church. Several doctors of the church um, – Leo the Great, Augustine, Thomas, Catherine of Siena, all refer to the the damnation of of Judas. Again, I'm not excited about this. I'm just telling you what the doctor. I'm just repeating what the doctors say. Um, and this, let me pull one of these. Saint Augustine, by hanging himself, he rather aggregated than expiated the guilt of that most iniquitous betrayal. Um, Judas Augustine, when he killed himself. Killed a wicked man and passed from this life chargeable not only with the death of Christ but also with his own um, St. Thomas Aquinas. In the case of Judas, the abuse of grace was the reason for his reprobation since he was made reprobate because he died without grace. Um, Died without grace. Bishop Paglia is taking on some heavy hitters. He's taking on some heavy hitters. These are these are these are doctors of the church. These are high T thinkers of the church and and and. (laughs) Uh, you've got, again, Leo the Great, uh, a doctor of the church, um, Augustine, uh, Su- uh, Thomas, uh, Catherine of Siena, four doctors of the church. Now, in, 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 trad- in the magisterium, it's never really been said. It's been understood as the, the theologians will show us that it's the church has the power to decree who is in heaven. 
And so and that's what we understand the canonization of saints. And may God allow that Archbishop Venerable Sheen would be would go to the altars as is right and just. But the church has the has the power to do that. But the church does not have the power to say who is in hell. But the doctors of the church, the, the teachings of the doctors of the church based on Scripture um, has given us some indication. And one of the things I found on this. Um, and the, and the, the one of the collects from the, the uh, Missal Romana 1962 version, the, the collect is this, O God, uh, from Holy Thursday, O God, from Judas received punishment of his guilt and the thief reward for his confession. Grant unto us the full fruit of thy clemency that it even as in the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ gave to each retribution according to his merits. So having cleared away our former guilt, he may bestow on us the grace of his resurrection, who to thee live and reign, etc. So we see we see an allusion to the punishment of Judas. And the church is not going to say, yeah, Judas is in hell. Good for us. We, you know, the church doesn't do that. But we get an indication that there is there is ramification for sin. And what 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 Catherine talks about is the violation of the, the, the sin of Judas was not just the suicide, but the despair, the despair of that. What he had done could not be forgiven by God. And so so this this would these would be the three areas that we can look at to build a theological opinion of this and not just to say, well, we need to accompany uh, all people um, in, in this or that way. Or Judas is, you know, it's, and, and to say that it's heresy. Uh, it's, it's one thing to say, look, let's discuss this according to the teachings of Pope John Paul, the, the Missa Redem Alam, what are the, what are the t- church teaches in Scripture, etc. It's another thing to claim that it's heresy to do otherwise, because now you've placed yourself in a very awkward position with four, among others, uh, Ephraim, the Syrian doctors of the church that have wow. said otherwise. Dan, let me ask you a question. Uh, you've heard this many times. You've, you've heard Chapter 2 of the Rite of Exorcism many times. Uh, here's one sentence from chapter two. It says, the priest says, yield to God, as he tells the energumen, uh, yield to God, who condemned you in the person of Judas Iscariot, the traitor. For he, pronoun Judas, for he now flails you with his divine scourges. So when chapter two of the rite of exorcism there's one sentence there which indicates very strongly that things didn't turn out very well for Judas Iscariot, that he may, right. that he may be in a very hot place. You know, when you die, you're either going to go to smoking or non-smoking. It indicates to me that he's in the smoking section of eternity, based on what I just read in Chapter 2 of the Rite of Exorcism. Right, and Chapter 2 is basically a calling out of the various acquires by means of the Psalms, um, reminding those fallen angels, particularly whichever one is afflicting this particular um, child of God in Ergamon that, sta- that lays before the priest and the team, um, that this is what this is where your dignity once was and you have fallen. And the human equivalent of that betrayal and fallen, you betrayed your creator God when and, and uh, um, when he created you and separated light from darkness and you chose eternal darkness and damnation. So too the human equivalent of it is Judas. And now again, this is this is this is a, a gray area. Um, but also Father Ripperger has talked about it in other experienced exorcists, the spirit of Judah, whether Judas, whether it's Judas himself or the demon that animated Judas, because it says in scripture in Matthew that he waited for him for a time and then entered the demon entered the devil entered Judas. So so um there have been occasions where priests under under the penal, under penalty of holy scourging uh, and authority during a ritual um, have have got information and brought out a Judas spirit. So whether it's Judas the person or that animating betraying spirit, this um, the, the 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 experience of exorcists is to say, yeah, we we've encountered this in in, in diabolic form, in one form or another. I, I, I don't think any exorcist has ever encountered in an ergamen the spirit of St. Francis of Assisi or the spirit of St. Catherine of Siena. So to say they've encountered the spirit of Judas, that doesn't look good. Let me ask you another question, Dan, before we wrap it up. There's a, there's a, good, there's a lot of priests, one good holy priest, Father Edward Perrone, Detroit priest who's been accused uh, by, uh, he's been, ac- been accused by, I guess, the diocese of, uh, of sexual improprieties. And what they've used the accuser has they've they've used what's called uh this repressed memory this this accuser all of a sudden 
remembered something that ha- supposedly happened decades ago. Now, I believe it's a political hit job because I know the character of this priest is a holy man of God. But uh, this whole repressed memory, Dan, uh, can there be something that, of the diabolical in, in a demon projecting something to a person? And, and uh, we, we want to call it now under this psychological term, repressed memory. Yeah, no, I've had I've had case, plenty of cases, particularly when um, um, when you're dealing with a diabolic and you get someone who was under the influence and in, in, uh, of of constant harangue in the in the memory when their inner when their inner faculties are are fa- are compromised. Yeah, the demon is all over that. And he's he's projecting memories. We've had many sessions. They come out of session and yeah, yeah. Did the, the priest rape me? Was everyone laughing at me? Um, they, the demon is projecting all these all these false memories to them. What's interesting, if you if, if the listeners want to look it up, there's a doctor by the name of McAnally, uh, Richard McAnally, Harvard. Uh, uh, um, he's he's a Harvard psychologist, and he said and, and under testimony and, and a tort testimony, he called repressed memory recovery quote the worst catastrophe to befall the mental health field since the lobotomy. So to anybody that would put stock in this, you're walking you're walking into a diabolic rabbit hole that you're not going to get out of. We've had people say, oh, I had a lady say, oh, I saw myself being born. I did this Father Yosef healing of memories thing, and I saw myself being born. I said, no, you didn't. You didn't see yourself being born. Right. That's a, that that is that is not a repressed memory. You know, and, and so the demon is all over that construct because he can he can we can psychologically create memories that don't exist. Um, and the demon can walk into that construct in the mind and project memories of events that took place. And they didn't really take place. And and, and, and the exorcists have gotten in trouble with this uh, when team members uh, try to try to uh, dabble or parlay in that. Let me ask you a question, Daddy. You just used and you got about a minute. You use the term. Demons project for for lay Catholics. Explain what you mean by demons being able to project. Think right. When I was a, when I was a helicopter pilot, we all, all helicopters. Every aircraft had one one station called guard that we could everybody could talk on at any time, on for emergencies only. Guard was guard is like our interior life. We we all communicate on the same frequency. Our own self talk, our communications with God, our prayer, God's. God's nudges to us, but also the demon can project thoughts and memories. Think of think of the seventies uh, reel to reel movies at the mo- drive in movie when they would project pictures of Coca Cola and and popcorn that that would suddenly the line people would get out of their cars and go buy popcorn and Coca Cola and they outlawed uh, that. So so the demon can when you've got a when you've got a brokenness in your memory and you have no custody of your intellect, which is why the rosary is such an important thing for us to to pray on a daily basis, meditative prayer. Meditation um, is so important because the demon now can enter and through the through psychological triggers, he can manipulate things and project thoughts, ideas that just aren't there. We know that. We know it's not our stuff. When you get thoughts of anger, so, vengeance. So like our, our, our thoughts are like a reel-to-reel movie, and the demon can put... Splices uh, in. Splices in Coca-Cola, popcorn in 10 seconds. You say, hey, where did that come from? Exactly. That's called projecting. Dan, thanks a lot, partner. All, All right. right. Well... Two alpha males were 10-7, off duty. Uh, Jesus Christ is Lord of all, Soul Patrol. Hey, up next, Gary Machuda, hands-on apologetics, the master apologist. See you next time, same Christ time, same Christ channel. Keep the faith. St. Faustina's Prayer for Priests O my Jesus, I beg thee on behalf of the whole Church, grant it love and the light of thy Spirit, and give power to the words of priests, so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to thee, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou thyself maintain them in holiness. O divine and great High Priest, May the power of thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares, which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. For thou canst do all things. Amen. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us.